if you woke up tomorrow morning and you had literally everything that you had ever dreamed of, you were the ultimate success story, would you be happy? On the surface, that sounds like kind of a silly question. But the reality is, for a lot of us, the idea of actually achieving all the things that we think we want creates a lot of anxiety, a lot of doubt about our ability to handle the success. And that is why on today's episode, we are talking about the fear of success in part three of our interview series with our special guest this week, Mr. Adam Jablin. So that is coming up here on Unshakable Habits. The right habits can help you have it all. More time, better health, improved relationships, and less stress. But most people lack the tools to stick with those habits long enough to see results. That is about to change. Welcome to Unshakable Habits with your host, Stephen Box. It's time to take your habits from unsustainable to unshakable. Welcome back. This is episode number 75 of Unshakable Habits. I am your host, Stephen Box. And today we are talking about the fear of success and more specifically, how it can create a lot of anxiety and doubt in our ability to handle that success. And this is part three of our interview series with Adam Javelin. And if you missed yesterday's episode, Adam was talking about overcoming the fear of change. And you're going to definitely want to check that episode out because we ended the episode with, I think, probably one of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard anybody give on dealing with change. So make sure you go back and check that out. But Adam, let's talk today about overcoming this fear of success. And the first question I want to ask you is, how does someone start to recognize that they even have this fear? I think when I work with clients and groups, what I see is they jump into that next reality. They jump into that that higher calling and they start telling me their fears right away. Mm-hmm. What does it look like in the family? What does it look like in my work life? How much hours and times am I going to have to dedicate this? What does it look like financially? More success doesn't necessarily mean abundance, right? So as you grow as a company, there are there's more invoices that come in. There's more there's more employees to pay. There's more there's more responsibilities. And what I see is they're fearing all of the newness. It's not the actual success. They're fearing the new. They're fearing the unknown. And since they're still them and they're not there yet, they can't calibrate. Yeah. They can't calibrate. It's not actually fear of success. It really isn't. It's fear of the unknown. I I think that's a, a good reframe, right? Where for a lot of people, it's the fear not of the success itself, but on their ability to handle the success because they're not sure what it's going to look like it's a whole new area it's if you make a hundred thousand dollars a year and you get an opportunity to make five hundred thousand dollars a year those are two completely different expectation sets at least mentally uh, of what's expected of you absolutely so you start playing with these false realities and putting on these false burdens and these false responsibilities it's a gradual process Yeah. The fear of success is truly the fear of unknown and and really fear of what's going to be expected of me. And sometimes the fear of judgment. So I see a lot of similarities between the fear of change, which we talked about yesterday, and the fear of success, because they're really about they're both about the fear of the unknown. Right. What one is more focused on maybe the, the fear of changes in the things that you do know versus that would be the fear of change. And then the fear of success is really more about just the complete unknown. But outside of that difference, is there anything else that's different about them? No, not a thing because it centers in the mind and you're not being present and dealing with what's in the now. You can dramatize, you can add little stories of what would look different. But again, None of those are reality. 
So the fear stems in the mind and you will feel what you're thinking every single time. That's scientifically proven. That's not an Adam Jablin thing. Yeah. I know many people are like, no, I woke up with this fear. I woke up with this. I woke up with my gut. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. But I would love to be able to be God and say, what were you thinking about before you went to bed? Or what have you, what have you really been thinking about the last seven days? And what have your actions looked like the last seven days? It, I mean, did somebody really um, have everything go well for them? Their kids are healthy. They're healthy. They have a connection to a higher power. They prayed for loved ones. They've taken care of their all of their emotional and true responsibilities. That, and, you know, just out of nowhere on the seventh day, just woke up with a paralyzing fear. And if they did wake up with that paralyzing fear, is it some connection to a higher source saying something needs to be autocorrected? But it's going to stem from the mind. If the brain's dead, have you ever seen, I, listen, I deal with alcohol addiction. Have you ever dealt with that? Yeah. When the brain is done, but the body keeps going, nothing's going on. That's when the doctors say, how long do we want to leave them on life support for? Yeah, I think that the mental aspect of it is so huge because it, it's like you said, there is this false reality that we start to live in. And I think a big part of this is, is that fear of judgment. Absolutely. Fear of judgment, fear of not getting what we want, fear of losing what we have. Fear. When we talk about this fear of the unknown and being judged and wondering if we're going to be good enough and all those kind of things, one area where this shows up for people is not when it's completely unknown, but when they've actually tried something, put themselves out there, and they actually had failure so the idea here it's still this fear of not being able to handle it but it's actually based in the reality that when they got there before they couldn't handle it what advice would you give to to that person oh i would give them the biggest hug a kiss on the cheek male or female and tell them that's the process failure is where it's all at you have to fail and fail and fail in order to succeed. I have not met anyone that accomplished their goals or dreams, their wonders without failure. Yeah. I'll give you an example. So in recovery, I go to, I, I'm a, I'm very proud to still be part of a 12 step fellowship. I've been for 18 years. Now that's where I just focus on my personal recovery. That's not where I do my coaching. That's just my own personal thing. And I'm very proud of it. And when I surrendered, I got one, they call it a, a white chip, right? It was my one surrender chip. Mm -hmm. right? And many people, when they go into recovery, they relapse, they'll get several of those. The thing is, that was not my one time. Like, I tried quitting drinking and drugging on my own many times. Yeah. You know what I mean? That was, I call that my surrender chip. That's when I surrender. And when you surrender, you stop fighting. Mm. And when you stop fighting, there's no failure. Let's use your favorite athlete. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. He doesn't believe in failure. Doesn't believe in it at all. Yeah. He was, and he, he was so candid about it. He was like, okay, so you lose. He goes, you lose. Guess what I do the next day? You get up, you watch film, you study it, uh, you go play the next game. He goes, okay, you win. Okay, guess what I do? I get up, I watch film, I practice. Nothing was different. Yeah. So failure is when you stop. If you don't stop, you're not failing. Even if you change course a little, you're not failing. Many times when airplanes are going from wherever you go, Arizona to Miami, whatever you want to make up, they have to change courses many times. They don't care about the course. They care about the outcome. They care about the destination. I think so many of us, we get focused on, on this idea of the outcome. Right? And we think that there's a set way to get to the outcome and that we have to get all the steps perfect to get to the outcome. But the reality is once you start to realize that you don't actually have full control over the actual outcome most of the time and that all you can control is the process, but the only part of the process you can actually control is your behaviors, your mindset, your actions. Yeah. And it, when, once you come to that realization, it leads to that surrender that you're talking about. Man, my surrender was from the deepness of my soul. It was from the deepness of my soul. Yeah. 
And I'll be honest with you, I actually have to surrender every day. I really do. It is the beginning of my day, in the beginning of my prayer, before my meditation. Because I'm human, I'm wired like every other human being. I want to visualize, I want to create, and I want the outcome I want. And God's taken me this far on his plan. I have to surrender now what my goals and dreams and aspirations are to do his will. I, I want to shoot you straight. Yeah, go ahead. We're bringing the, the Michael Jordan Kobe stuff in it. We live in a very strange age for me personally. Okay. I'm 47 years old and I've always been wired like this. I've always wired to help people, always wired to, to guide people. I was the kid where I could knock you out in football and I would just wrap you up with a proper tackle when I was boxing and I was good, I would show my opponent what I did after and my coaches would scream at me and yell at me and make me feel very feminine. It made me feel feminine, although I'm masculine. And now in today's day and age, everybody wants to be a coach and it weirds me out because I'm wired like that. I don't want to be the coach. I want to, you want to know my ego? I want to be Michael. I want to be Kobe. I don't want to be Phil Jackson. I am Phil Jackson. It is what I have been created to do. But my ego, I want the ball in my hands. I want the sneaker contract. I want my tongue out. I want to hit the winning game shot. I watched the last dance for Michael, not for Phil Jackson. So it's a very strange age for me that everybody wants to be a coach. And I like to check people's motives on that. They want to really be a coach and really help people with their lives. Or do they want a lot of attention on social media and Instagram and reels and, and find a way to make money? Yeah, yeah I, I can relate to that because I'm really the same, right? Where there's a part of me that's, I want to make $10 million a year and I want to have this huge business and I want to do all these things. And like you said, I want to be Michael Jordan. I want to be Kobe Bryant. But at the end of the day, if I get a big check, it's nice, but it doesn't fulfill me. What fulfills me is... When I'm working with a client and I'm coaching them, or if I'm having a conversation and I can give a great piece of advice or shift a perspective for somebody, or I get on here and I get to have conversations with people like you and then share it out with the world. Like, that's the stuff that fulfills me. The other yeah. stuff is nice, but that's not what fulfills me. Yeah. It's not saying that we can't have both. I would honestly, if I, if money wasn't the object, if I could just do whatever... I would probably just coach people for free all day long. Just, that's how much I love coaching people. But I have bills to pay, so I do have to charge for it. Yeah. That's the law of giving and receiving too. Yeah. Money is just an energy exchange. That's all it is. If you and I were born around Christ's time, it wouldn't be, no, that's not true because they that was give with Caesars, but it would be a barter system. You would coach them and they would give you milk. Or they would give you bread. You know what I mean? It's It's an energy exchange. Maybe I should just start charging people in tacos. That might be really a good route to go here. Delicious. All right, well, Adam, let's end with the, the, the simple question. If someone is dealing with this fear of success or really as we've more appropriately said it, this fear of worrying that they're not going to be able to handle when things get big, what's the, the one piece of advice you can give them to walk away with today? Get quiet, get centered, realize that you're living in a false reality that's not where you're at now, and take the small steps to build and grow to your dreams. So where we're really taking, following up on your advice from yesterday, we're really taking that idea of dancing with it and sampling it, and we're taking now the next step, and we're starting to, to build upon it. Yeah, look. I don't think any of us really want to win American Idol. You win American Idol and you're famous for a day and no one hears from you again. And then there's another show. Yeah. All of us want to be there for the long term. Adam, that is a fantastic segue to allow us to start to wrap up the show here. Uh, guys, real quickly, before I tell you what we are talking about tomorrow, if you are getting a lot of value from Adam this week, make sure that you share these episodes with somebody else so they can also get that value. And if you're listening to us on Apple or Spotify right now, we'd greatly appreciate if you could take a moment to leave us a five-star review as well. 
So tomorrow, we're going to be talking about the fear of failure. More specifically, how do you bounce back when you have failure? Because as Adam just mentioned, we all want that long-term success. And one of the key elements of getting long-term success is the ability to bounce back when you do have failure. Because as Adam said earlier, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. We're all going to have failure as part of the process. So tomorrow we're going to teach you how to bounce back when that happens. But until then, I remind you, as always, that while none of us are born unshakable, we can all become unshakable. <laughs>